Okay. So today we're going to go over code forces A and B problems. Um, so in case you don't know what that is, code forces is an online uh, competitive programming platform, and there's usually like five to seven uh, problems per competition. So these are just the first two easiest ones, pretty much. Um, and can you guys see my screen okay, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, so just some general tips on how to solve these A and B problems before we get into it. They seem very intimidating at first, and it seems almost like you have to brute force to get an answer, but they usually rely on a very simple trick. Uh, so if you came to our first meeting, that was an example of a trick that's very simple to find. And the best way to learn these tricks is through practice. So that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to go through a bunch of A and B problems and try to work on the solutions together. So before we get into that, just some general competitive programming advice. Don't rush into implementation, so don't rush into coding. Make sure you have a solid idea. Um, so yeah, look for the tricks before and that make implementation easier and make sure that your solution is solid and will actually run in time. Uh, work out test cases and look for patterns. So it's best to have a piece of paper and a pen with you or a pencil um, and find ways to represent the problem and work it out. It's usually just writing out a sequence, but sometimes it's more complicated than that. And don't get stuck on one idea for too long. Try new things often. So uh, if the approach you're looking at right now, if you're stuck on it, it's probably a different approach that you're looking for, not the one that you're working on. So try to try different approaches, go at different angles. All right, so those are just the general advice. Now we're going to get into the problems. So the first one was on a code forces round uh, a few days ago. So basically, there is a 2 by n grid filled with dominoes. Horizontal dominoes are denoted with LR and vertical with UD. Uh, so here's an example below. Um, there's an LR domino, there's a UD domino, LR. Uh, you are given one row of the dominoes. So you're given the top row or the bottom row, and you have to recover the other row. So I'll give, I'm sure some of you have seen this already, so I'll give everyone like a minute to think about it. Um, so given one of the rows, how do you recover either the top or bottom row? I haven't seen this one before. Just to confirm, is it always possible? Are you guaranteed that? Yeah, it's always possible. Okay. What do you mean by recover? So basically, they'll give you like either the top row or the bottom row. So either they'll give you either LRU LR for the top row or LRD LR for the bottom row. And then you have to figure out what the other row is supposed to be. Um, so for instance, if they give you LRU LR, you have to recover, you have to print out LRD LR, so the bottom row in that case. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there something in the chat box? Yeah. Okay, let me read it. If it's L or R, just copy the character, and if it is D copy U and if it's U. Yeah, so that's exactly it. Um, so let's go to the solution. Uh, yeah, so exactly what Abdul said. Notice that the rows are the same except with the U's and the D's swapped. So you can, uh, and the other rows are just, you can copy the L and the R down. Uh, yeah, so you can just go through the original string and replace all U's with D's and vice versa. Um, so for instance, here, I'll, I'll just go to the code because it will help illustrate this. Um, so yeah, this is in C++. So I'm not sure if you guys know this yet, but I can explain it line for line. Uh, so basically, we have a long, long n here. Uh, so long, long is just a type we use. It has, it can store the most values. So it can go up to 10 to the, uh, I think 9 to the times 10 to the 18th, actually. Uh, and that prevents overflow. Uh, so like exceeding the max value. Um, and then we input a string S. So this is the top row or the bottom row. We input that. So we uh, get that from the input. And then we store, we're going to store the resultant string in this string called res. So that's short for result. And then we loop through all n characters. So n is the number of characters in S. So we loop through all characters in S. If it's a U, then the, the string that we're trying to recover is just going to have a D in that position because that's uh, the bottom domino. If it's a D, the string that we're trying to recover will have a U because that's the top position. And then if it's an L or an R, uh, those are the two other cases. We just add an L or an R to the, to the resultant string. And we print out result at the end. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the code here? 
for the problem. Nope. Uh, so yeah, I just, I included the C++ code. Don't worry too much if you don't understand it, just to give you an example of how input output works um, and how to code in C++ when you're in the code forces round. Yeah, so next week, uh, we're going to go a lot more in depth into C++ and all the built-in data structures and everything. Um, but for now, you don't need to worry too much about C++. Mm -hmm. OK. So that is the first problem. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch more. So the next question is odd divisors. So you're given a large integer x. It can go up to 10 to the 18th. And you have to determine if it has an odd divisor. Uh, so for instance, and if it does have an odd divisor, you print yes. And if it doesn't, you print no. So for instance, six does have an odd divisor. Three is, uh, six is divisible by three and three is odd greater than one. So we print yes in that case, but four does not. Uh, the only divisors it has are one, two, and four. And two, uh, two and four are both even. And one is obviously not greater than one. So we would print no in that case. So basically what we're trying to do is determine whether X has an odd divisor or not. So if you have any ideas, feel free to put it in the comment or unmute yourself. One idea like here, here is um, if basically you're always going to have an odd divisor unless you're a power of two, correct? Yeah, that's, that's it exactly, actually. Yes. And why, do you know why that is? Because all prime factors are odd except for two. Yes. <laughs> so basically, um, let's let's go to the next slide. So if you, uh, what does a number with no odd factors greater than one look like? So all of its prime fa factors must be even. Uh, because if it had a prime factor that was odd, then uh, it would have an odd factor greater than one. So that means that the only prime factor it can have is two. Um, which basically means it must be a power of two. Um, so one way to code this is you can pre-compute all the powers of two and then just check if X is in that list. Uh, but the way I'm doing it is basically what I do is I input X. This is what the first line means is I take X from the input. And while it's divisible by two, I divide it by two. So I just keep on taking out the divisors of two. And at the end, if it's equal to one, then it has no odd divisors. If it's if it's greater than one or it's not equal to one, then it does have odd divisors. So yeah, this this statement down here just means uh, it's like if else. So x equals one is the if statement. Then print no, and then the colon is the else. Else print yes. So yeah, we'll go and we'll go more in depth in that next week. But I just want to give a intro to the code. Anybody have any questions on? Uh, the code or the problem or anything covered so far. Nope. Okay. All right. So now uh, we're going to go into a little bit of a different topic. We're going to go into, oh, there's a question. Does every num have a prime factor? Yeah. So that, uh, that kind of relies on like the prime factorization of a number. So basically you can show, uh, basically you can show that any number can be like decomp, like composed into different prime, uh, the multiple of the product of prime numbers basically. Uh, so for instance, like six can be two times three. Uh, this isn't really a CS topic, it's more of a math topic, but uh, any like 18 can be three times three times two. Um, so it's only prime factors two in this case, in the problem we went over. Okay, so now we're moving on to a little bit of a different topic, uh, the bitwise OR. So this is a topic that pops up a lot in uh, code forces problems, especially A and B problems. Um, so basically the ZOR is usually represented by a caret in most programming languages. And uh, to compute the ZOR of two numbers, we write A and B in binary and the ith bit is set if the bit, if uh, the ith bit of a and b don't match. So that's a little bit complicated, so I'll deconstruct that. Uh, so if x and y are just one bit each, um, so for instance, x is zero and y is zero, 
then x or y is going to be zero. So it's only going to be one if the if x and y are different. Uh, so for instance, x is zero, y is one. It's going to be one because x or y is uh, because x and y are different in that case. Same thing with one and zero. It's going to be one because x and y are different. But when they're both one, they're the same. So the zero is not going to be one. It's going to be zero. Uh, before I get into this, does everybody? I'm not sure if you guys know about binary representations of integers. Does anybody? Does everybody know about that, or are there people who don't know about binary representation? No, I don't know. Okay, so uh, basically, how can I explain this, Joe? Do you know? Oh. Um, so basically, the idea is you want to represent every number as a sum of distinct powers of two. Um, so, like we have the example on the slide here of like five and nine. Um, so you represent five as like four plus one and nine is eight plus one. And then you can sort of uh, turn that into a string of ones and zeros um, where like the jth position is a one if you're using two to the j sort of. So like for five, um, you can imagine that those positions are numbered zero through three from the right. Um, and since five is four plus one, which is two squared plus two to the zero, um, the zero and two positions um, are both one there. Would uh, you be stuck at 255 as your largest value? Um, well, it's whatever size, uh, like whatever the maximum size of your integers is. So if you're using long longs, that's two to the 64, I think. Yeah. Maybe 63 I mean, signs. I don't know. 255 would be the maximum value if there's like eight bits, right? Yeah. Uh, you can so imagine like, that there's like a bunch of zeros to the left of all these numbers, essentially. Yeah. One one sort of uh, way to think about this is this is just this is sort of a generalization of how we normally write numbers. So, when we write numbers in base ten, so we use digits from you know zero to, to zero to nine, and use like multiples of powers of ten. So this is the same sort of thing. We use multiples of powers of two, except we only use zero. We only go up to two because it's you know, up to two. So it's like called base two as opposed to base ten. And so similarly, when you write digits normally, we sort of assume there's a whole bunch of zeros to the left that we just keep on writing more if we need to. And you can do the same yeah. thing here. Yeah, like I wrote in I wrote in the chat, like uh, one way you could represent like 212 is by like what Akif said is representing as the sum of powers of 10. Um, so this is the same thing except with powers of two. Um, so instead of doing like two times 10 to the second, you would do like zero times two to the second or something like that. Uh, yes, yeah, so that it takes a while to get like caught on to that. But basically, every every integer, every number can be represented as uh, a binary number. Um, so we gave some examples here with five and nine. Um, so for Zor, you write it out. So basically, how you take the Zor of two numbers is you write it out in binary, and then you use this logic table to the left here, and you do it bit by bit. Um, so looking at five and nine. We look at the last, the last least significant bit. It's called the last uh, bit on e on five and nine. They're both one, so the last bit on A or B is going to be zero because we look at the logic table here. If they're both one, it, uh, X or Y is zero. So one and one, that's going to be zero. The next bit is zero uh, on A and zero on B. The zero of that's going to be zero. Uh, one and zero, that's going to be one, and zero and one, that's going to be one. So A, A or B is going to be 1100 zero, zero in binary, which is just 12. Um, yeah. And, and then, notice that uh, the, the leading zeros don't affect anything here. So you can add as many zeros as you want to the left to both of those, and it doesn't change the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one sort of way to remember the logic table is that it's like a does not equal statement. So, it, so the resulting bit is 1 if the input bits are not equal, and it's 0 if they are equal. Yeah. Uh, anybody, any questions on this? Okay. So there's some important properties of Zors. Uh, so anything Zord itself is equal to zero. That's kind of like what Akeep just said. If the bits are equal, then uh, the result's going to be zero. That, that comes from that fact. Um, a Zord zero is going to equal A. So anything Zord zero is going to equal itself. Uh, the Zor is commutative, so A Zor B is equal to B Zor A. 
dissociative A zor B zor C is equal to A zor B zor Z. Uh, that the last one on this on the left here. And we have this cool fact that if A zor B is equal to C, then we have two facts that are true. B zor C is equal to A and A zor C is equal to B. Um, so yeah, problems usually simplify pretty well when you have those with SOAR in it. So we're going to go over some prob problems with SOAR. Uh, the first one is you're given a sequence. It's kind of like the Fibonacci sequence, if you've heard of that. So the first term is A, the second term is B, and then every term after that is the SOAR of the previous two terms. And you're given A and you're given B, and you're given some integer N, and you're trying to find the nth term in this sequence in constant time. Um, so just a hint here is that it, it helps to brute force this. So pick some A and B and then uh, try to find the first few terms and see if there's any patterns there. And also these properties back here are going to help a little bit too. Um, yeah, so, so I, I would say don't pick a specific A and B. Just keep them as like the variables A and B mm -hmm. um, and see what you can do there. Don't try to do any like actual numerical stuff. We should probably take a few minutes right now and just have everyone should just like try it honestly. It's a pretty cool. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. So the problem for anyone who missed it is yeah. um, your first term is A, your second term is B, and every term after that is the Zor of the previous two. And so like, the term. it would help here to find what the second term is in terms of A and B, what the third term is in terms of A and B, and then just keep on repeating that. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a minute or two. All right. Someone got it in chat. Yeah. Yeah, that is the correct answer. So um, let's see. So basically, it's going to repeat itself. Uh, so let's brute first the first few terms. So the the zeroth term is a. The first term is b. The second term is a zor b. The third term is a zor b zor b. But since it's associative, you can move it to a zor b zor b. And b zor b is going to equal zero. That's one of the properties we found. And anything zor zero is itself. So uh, S of three is going to equal A. And then if we do it one more time, it's we have a, uh, S of three or S of two, which is A or A or B. And we can do the same trick that we did before, change the parentheses. Uh, a or A is equal to zero, and zero or B is equal to itself B. Um, so we're back where we started with A and B. So this pattern is just going to repeat itself uh, every three terms. Uh, pattern repeats itself every three steps. So the code's going to look like this. Um, we can basically we check. So the modulo op operator basically takes the remainder divided by some number. Um, in case you haven't learned that yet. So if it's divisible by three, that means it's going to be the first term a. If it's uh, remainder is one, when you divide it by three, it's going to be the second term b. And if it's remainder is two uh, divided by three, it's going to be a or b. Um, so this is the code down here. It's pretty simple. It's only like three lines. Any questions on that? There's some stuff in the chat. Yeah, exactly. Use modulo to determine the nth term in O of one time. Uh, OK. Any questions? All right, we're going to do another Zor problem. Uh, this one's a little bit harder. So you're given some integer n, and you want to compute the Zor of the first n uh, natural numbers in constant time. So like if n is 10 to the 18th, we can't just brute force this. Uh, we need to find it uh, instantly, basically. Um, so it could help to do the Zor of the first few terms. Uh, try it yourself. I'll show you in a little bit. And then look for a pattern in these terms. So do uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, uh, 0, 2, and so on, and see what the numbers come out to. So I'll give you a minute. I think... No, 0, 0, 1 is 1, right? Every, at zero, anything 0, 0 is 0. Uh, 
I think for this problem, um, it might be nice to just give the terms. Okay, yeah, uh, we can um, do that. Yeah, because it's a lot of work to kind of get there. Yeah, so these are the first, I don't know how many terms, uh, looks like 12. Yeah. So do you guys see any patterns in these first few terms? Just like, even if you can't come up with a pattern for all of them, just like some general patterns you see, you can put them in the chat or unmute yourself. So am I unmuted? Yes. Because every like, before, after every zero, it's like the next term is adding the previous two terms. After so every like, zero. Uh, you have zero and before that. You oh have yeah, that is true. Four. I didn't even notice that. Uh, but what, how often do the zeros repeat? That's one thing. Yeah, every fourth number is a zero. Um, Sir, I don't see how does 8 plus 1 equal 11? Am, am I confused? I may not understand what, you, what you're saying. No, no, no. It's just 7 plus 1 is 8 before that. And then... But how do you get... Oh, no. oh okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. 1 and 3 add to 4. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. There's two terms that repeat itself pretty uh, normally. Um, let's see. Do you guys see that? It's a zero and one that repeat, right? Yeah, exactly. And do they repeat? I think the zero repeats if we're looking at it mod four. Zero repeats one mod four. And the one repeats two mod four? No. Uh, I think that's correct. Oh, one thing I noticed is that that first zero isn't part of the repeating zeros. That's like yeah, zero. okay, yeah, yeah. So so zero repeats is zero mod four. Then I think. Well, also so we start point. counting at zero. So the first term is the zero, like n equals zero. The second term is n equals one. So it's actually like mod. It's three mod four. It repeats. Okay, my bad. Yeah. So three three mod four. And. The one repeats one mod four. Yeah, exactly. And you know what the terms in between, uh, what the pattern is there? Can you see that? It seems like you're adding. Um, one plus three equals four. Four plus three equals seven. There's an even like easier way to represent these. Um, the num. Oh. The number after the ones, it starts at three, and then you just keep on adding four, and the number after zero, you keep on adding four also. Exactly, yeah. Um, so an easier way to say that is, I'll go to the solution slide. Um, so yeah, the first few terms, we realize that it repeats every four, um, and the distance between like A4 and A0 is four, A8 and A4 is four. Um, and then A1 is always one. The one mod four is going to be always one and three mod four is always going to be zero. Um, and then we can have like this general formula, uh, a four K equals four K. So when it's uh, zero mod four, it's equal to itself. When it's mo one mod four, it's equal to one. When it's two mod four, this is basically saying it's equal to itself plus one. And when it's three mod four, it's equal to zero. So that's basically what we came to the conclusion to. And, um, the code is really simple. You just input n in the first line, and then you do all the cases. So if it's 0 mod 4, you print n itself. If it's 1 mod 4, you print 1. If it's 2 mod 4, you print uh, itself plus 1. And if it's uh, 3 mod 4, you print 0. Any questions there? So this is a problem we sort of included uh, just to show you that, like, um, just doing things by hand and trying small test cases can be very helpful. Because if you wanted to prove this, it would be very hard. Like given this formula, you could probably prove it pretty nicely using induction or something like that. But just getting this formula out of nowhere would be very hard. Um, but if you do the first few uh, cases and you look for patterns, um, you can sort of get the solution without having to really prove anything, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was the same thing with the uh, problem before. It's just kind of brute forcing it and seeing the patterns, not necessarily having to prove it. Um, okay.
so we're going to move away from Zor now onto other problems. Uh, so this one is you're given a number x, and you're trying to find two integers a and b such that a and b are between 1 and x inclusive. a is divisible by b, a times b is greater than x, and a divided by b is less than x. Or you can say that no such a or b exists. Um, so I'll give you a minute to think about this. Really important here is that you don't overthink it. Uh, the solution is probably simpler than you think. So, Any ideas you have, you can put in the chat or unmute yourself. First check if A. Oh, so you're trying to find A or B. You're not trying to dollar, like check if this is true. So A and B, you have to print out A and B yourself, and they both have to be less than or equal to X. So one thing I see immediately, I I feel like if it's prime, there's no solution. Um, that's a good that's a good example actually. If it's prime, there's a there is a solution. Uh, one of these sample cases is prime. We have uh, yeah. x equals three as one of them, and there's a solution. Oh. Oh, okay. I thought a and b had to be factors of x. My bad. Condition. Okay, yeah, we're getting some good answers here. So for the run a loop between one and x and check if the condition and if the... So the issue with this is we're trying to do this in constant time. Uh, so we don't want to run a loop here. Um, and Abdul is onto something here. He's very close. And I think somebody might have said it before. Um, so yeah, you want to assign A and B to something very simple. Yeah. So X minus one is very close. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said in the chat, um, that doesn't work for X equals two. But there is a solution for X equals two. Does anybody know the solution for x equals 2? You can probably just brute force it. Would it be 2 and 2? Yeah, it would be 2 and 2. Uh, and can we generalize this to like greater, larger x? Is it the, um, the least even number less than... Le um, less than or equal to x. The least even number less than or equal to x. Max got it. Um, that one always divide though. Yeah, Max got it. It's it's just x and x. A and b are x and x. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, if x equals one, the only option is a. Okay. Yeah, a and b is equal to x. So let's check all these conditions are true. Is A and B less than or equal to between one and X? That is true because they're both equal to X. Is A uh, divisible by B? Yes, because X divides B. Um, and A times B is going to equal X squared greater than X, uh, which is true for anything, for any X greater than one. So for one, there is actually no uh, solution. And then is x is a divided by b less than x? That is true because x divided by x is one, which is less than x when x is greater than one. Wait, um, so I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Will they try generally to trick you with those test cases? Because here the example is just x, the answer is just x and x, but the examples none of them said that. Yeah, they uh they might do that because they want to they don't want to be too obvious with uh the solution. Uh, yeah. I don't think they ever try to like trick you on purpose, though. But you know, the sample cases do try to trick you sometimes. Oh okay. yeah. I think this was one example where they tried to do that. Okay. I, I think the one we see later of the domino, of the tiling one, that's another example. Yeah. So does everything have a solution besides one, or? Yeah, because for everything you can just do x and x, uh, but it doesn't work for one. So one doesn't have a solution. Um. So the code for this, 
Uh, there's something missing in this code, which is checking if X is equal to one in this, in which case you would like print negative one, which usually signifies no solution. Uh, but the logic is the same here. You just, uh, input X and print X and X. So just make sure there was like check for if X equals one. Okay. Any questions on this one? Yeah. Could you do, um, so could you do a is for anything besides one, I guess you could, could you do a equals two and then B equals um x mod wait no x divided by two or uh so plus one. Oh, x divided by two x divided by i two mean that wouldn't one. be that wouldn't be greater than uh that wouldn't be greater than x though like a times b wouldn't be greater than x right in that case oh no divided by two plus one Gosh, I'm not yeah plus one i guess uh, that probably wouldn't work for x equals two. Let me let me do the math real quick. Uh, that was the same thing. It gives you two and two again. Yeah. Oh, it does give you two and two. I guess that would work then. Wouldn't it be divisible. That's the issue. You have to make sure. Yeah. It's not even. But you could do like even. you could do like x, like you could do x divided by two plus one, like the floor division, right? No, even then, right? You don't know if that's gonna be even or odd. You could just add one if it's. Odd. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think that would work. But then, yeah. but you, then like, you might go over for like three or something, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Because if you do four, yeah, you yeah, that plus work one. Three. Yeah. This this one Wait. is just a le least amount of case work because it's just yeah. if it's not one, you just have to print uh, x and x. It's really simple to code. But there are there's probably a bunch of other alternate solutions. Uh, that's usually true with A and B problems. All right. Uh, any other questions or should I move on? Okay, I'll move on. All right, so in this problem, you're given an n by m grid. Uh, so you're just given the integers n and m, and you want to output a grid uh, with w's and b's, so with uh, white cells and black cells. And basically what you want to do is you want to output an n by n grid such that uh, you let W equal the number of white cells touching black cells and B be equal to the number of black cells touching white cells. So in this sample case here, with N and M equals to three, uh, the number of white cells touching black cells, uh, W is equal to four. Um, so you have like the top middle touches two black cells, the right middle touches two black cells and the bottom middle touches two black cells. And the number of black cells touching white cells is equal to five. Uh, you can kind of just go through the case uh, every square there. And you're looking for a grid such that the uh, B equals W plus one. Um, so the number of white cells touching black cells plus one is equal to the number of black cells touching white cells. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that? That's a little complicated of a problem statement. So. Is it like Minesweeper in that diagonals also count as contacts? No, I think it's only uh, horizontal or vertical. Uh, yeah, like this way, this way, or this way, not the diagonals. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah, is an, this is another one where really don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcomplicate it because you can come up with some really convoluted solutions to this. Um, but there's a nice way to do it. All right, so we have like a checkerboard pattern in the comments. Uh, does that work? That's gonna work if uh, N and M are both odd. Okay. Um, because that way, um, basically every white cell is adjacent to a black cell, every black cell is adjacent to a white cell. And because N times M is odd, um, one of them is gonna be one bigger than the other. Um, so that works out as long as you make sure the black cells are in the corners. Um, it might help to have like a paper and pen here. Yeah, for, for all of these problems, yeah. you guys should be trying yeah. out sample cases on a pencil and paper and just, just messing with it. It really helps. So there is a way to modify the checkerboard solution uh, to work for uh, an even size grid too. Um, so if you guys want to think about that, you can. Uh, that's actually how I solved this when I first saw it, but that is significantly harder um, than 
the other solution. So you guys can think about that too. One maybe small hint is think about the different types of squares and how they contribute to W and B and try, try out the different cases for that. So I have a different types, I mean corner versus edge versus middle and see how they contribute to W and B. Like for this one, at least all the corners are black, because I guess it reduces the number of con contacts because it only has two. I, I, um, I don't know why though? Yeah, this is like a case where the the sample case is trying to mislead you, like Joe said. So I, the solution is actually like very, very, very simple. Um, yeah, that's uh. That's very close. What Michael said in the chat, it's basically That's the same thing. But, yeah, but flipped the white yeah. in the corner and the black on the outsides. So yeah, that's the solution. Uh, so I'll give you, I'll show you like a picture to show you. Um, so when we have this configuration where the white it, on the top left it's white and the rest of them are black, we have W equals one and B equals two. Um, by uh, yeah, so this is this is the simplest solution that we can come up with, and it's super easy to program. Um, yeah, so the program is just you loop through uh, first you input n and m, the uh, size of the the rows and columns of the grid, then you loop through n times, loop through m times, um, and then you print w if we're at the top left corner. So that's when i equals zero and j equals zero. The num uh, the row number and the column number are both equal to zero. We print out W. Otherwise, we just print out black for the rest of the uh, grid squares. And that's basically all this program does. Uh, so super simple to program. Uh, any questions there? OK, cool. Let's move on. All right, this one's a little tricky. So the LCM problem, so you're given two integers, L and R, and you're trying to find any X and Y such that uh, X and Y are between L and R and X is less than Y. Um, and they're, and the LCM of X and Y is between L and R. So LCM stands for least common multiple of X and Y. Uh, you probably covered this a while ago in school, if you don't remember. Uh, but basically, it's the, the smallest integer that is divisible by both X and Y, I believe is close to the definition of what LCM is. Um, an important fact is that LCM X and Y is equal to X times Y divided by the GCD. So GCD is the greatest common divisor. Um, so the, the largest number that is X is divisible by and Y is divisible by, but that may or may not be useful for this problem. Uh, so my help with an example, when L is one and R is 15, one example of, uh, one example of a solution we could have is x is equal to 6. Uh, well, these are supposed to be swapped, actually. x is equal to 4 and y is equal to 6. Um, both of those are between 1 and uh, 15. And their LCM is also between 1 and 15. Uh, it's 12. So any questions on this problem? I'll give you like a few minutes to work on it. One thing that the answer may not exist, right? I think we should make yes, that. that's true. That's true. The answer may not exist. A very easy case to see that is if L minus R is just one. Yeah. So if you have like 13 and 14, there's only one possible number. So X and Y just cannot exist even by the first condition. Well, you can have X and Y, but their LCM is just too big. You can do like X equals 13, Y equals 14. But then the LCM. Oh, is sorry. I see. I mean, fine. what if L equals R? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if. Oh, yeah, they have to be. They can't be equal to each other, X and Y. So. I sort of, I think I know like a brute force solution, but it's kind of like, it would take a good amount of time. Okay. What would you your brute force be? Take just... R and then keep looping down by one and see if like your number 
going down to like R minus one, minus two. You could see if it's mod X and mod Y, and then that would be your okay. Yeah, that, that would take uh, that would take too long. We're trying to do this in like constant time, basically. Also, uh, the other thing is you don't know X and Y, mm -hmm. um, so finding those would be hard. There, this is another yeah. one where the sample cases are kind of deceiving you. Yeah, so keep that in mind too. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I remember for this one, thinking about like sample cases is slightly less important than rather than thinking logically and trying to force yeah. things to be true. Yeah. So like one thing that you're trying to do here is uh, you're trying to make the LCM as like small as possible, right? Uh, so what are like some ex examples of numbers where the LCM is like close to the, those numbers themselves? Um, could you look at, like, the smallest prime factors of R? That would also probably take too long because we're trying to do this in constant time. Somebody said X equals L and Y equals R. The issue with that is, like, your LCM could be greater than R uh, or less than L, maybe. Um, if X divides Y, then LCM equals Y. Yeah, that's a very good point. If X divides Y, then LCM equals Y. You should be able to use that in this problem. One thing, just so I can uh, clarify, David made a good point here, maybe that you sort of maybe slightly glossed over, is that uh, he was trying to force the LCM to be as small as possible. And the reason for that is that since your X and Y are both greater than or equal to L, their LCM also has to be greater than or equal to L. So then the only constraint yeah. that remains is the LCM has to be less than or equal to R. So that's why we're trying to make the LCM as small as possible. All right, yeah, Thomas is very close. Uh, I, think I think that would that actually... Works. Yeah, that works. Um... There's a there's a little bit of a cleaner way to do it, but it's it's pretty much the same. Uh, so yeah, he has the right idea. You want you basically want one of them to be the other one times two, uh, because that way, the LCM is so like I'll just go to the solution side real quick. Um, so like Akif said, uh, the LCM of x and y is guaranteed to be greater than both x and y, um, which are both greater than y, l. So we're really only looking for a pair where in the range where LCM X and Y is less than or equal to R. Um, yes, and because X does not equal Y, the, st the smallest we can get LCM of X and Y is two times uh, the smaller one, which is X. So LCM of X and Y is going to have to be greater than or equal to 2L. So that basically what this gives us is if R is less than 2L, there is no solution. It's impossible to find a valid solution. Um, but if R is greater than or equal to 2L, we can just take X equal to the lower bound. We can take X equal to L and Y equal to 2 times L. Um, and both will line the range LR. And their LCM is going to be 2L uh, because X divides Y, uh, which is also in the range L and R. Uh, so it might help with an example, so I'll put one in the chat. So like, let's say uh, L is equal to 2 and R is equal to 5. We can do X equals to 2 and Y equals to 4. So I'll just post that. Uh, so you do X is equal to the lower bound, 2, and then Y is equal to 2 times L. Uh, let's go through the code real quick. Um, so first we input L and R. If two times L is less than or equal to R, we print out the lower bound, uh, we print out L, uh, followed by space, followed by two L. So that's X is L, Y is two L. And otherwise we print out no solution, which is usually represented by negative one in code forces. All right. Any questions on that problem? All right, cool. I'll move on then. All right, so we're going to go into some string problems now. Uh, and we'll give a background on strings before that. Uh, so a string A is a subsequence of a string B if the characters appear 
uh, if the characters of A appear in any order in order in B. Uh, so, for example, A B C is a subsequence of A X Y B C K, because uh, the string the characters of uh, A B C A comes first, followed by B, followed by C, and that's their order in uh, the other in A X B C K. Uh, so that's one property. Yeah, uh, one way yes. I like to think about subsequences, um, which is sometimes useful, is that you can delete characters anywhere in the string and then get the subsequence. Mm -hmm. So for here, you can delete X, Y, and K, and then you'll get A, B, and C. Yeah. Um, another kind of background on strings is a period of a string S is the smallest K such that S of I is equal to S of I plus K for all I. Uh, so basically, it's like how often the string repeats itself. Um, so, for example, 0, 0, 0, 0, it's 1 because uh, S of I is always equal to S of I plus 1. And then for this one, uh, we have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, 0, 1, 1 just repeats itself. Uh, and the length of 0, 1, 1 is 3. So that's the period. Um, yeah. So those are two things that you need to know for the next problem. Uh, so you're given a string of size n. And you want to print t such that s is a subsequence of t, and t has at most uh, two n char uh, has a size of at most two n, and you want t to have the the smallest period as possible. Uh, so for some examples here, uh, you have s is equal to one 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 one, and then t is going to be equal to one 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 also. So that has a period of one. That's the smallest uh, period you can get. And s is equal to one one zero, and then t is equal to one zero one zero, and that has a period of two because one zero just repeats itself, so the smallest it can get. Um, isn't t supposed to be ten characters in the first example? Yeah. Uh, t can be anywhere between n and two n characters. Oh, size at most two n. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um. So. Just post any thoughts you have or ideas you have in the chat or, you know, mute yourself. So thinking about when you can solve it for small periods, so period one and two is very helpful. Uh, yes, S only has ones and zeros. Yeah, we forgot to put that there. Yeah, that's a good point. If it's all of one digit, print the entire string because one is the smallest uh period you can get so you can't do any better than that so you might as well just print uh the entire string what do you what do you do if they're not all of the same digit though there's a there's a trick you can do here and then there's a hint here is uh when can you solve the problem for small periods so think about ones or twos periods of ones or twos how do you solve those Oh, yeah, I'm seeing some good uh, thoughts in here. Michael, we, we uh, should have clarified this before, but it's only binary strings. Uh, so only yeah, ones it's only ones. zeros and ones. Uh, Alexander got it, or an uh, alternative solution. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's good. So basically, the simplest solution here is... Um, so if, it's, if the characters match, you just print out uh, S, because that's... Uh, the period will be one, that's as small as you can get it, and S is a subsequence of S. Otherwise, we try to get a period of two because it's impossible to get a period of one. So to get a period of two, we can just always print out zero and one n times. And the reason we can do this is uh, if when zero and one is repeated n times, any S, any binary string S of length n will be a subsequence of uh, T, the zeros and ones printed out uh, n times. And to see this, we kind of color coordinated S and T. Uh, so the zero, the first zero belongs to the first zero and one, the first zero of the zero and one. The second one belongs to the first zero and one in the in T. And you can see basically we just assign the ith uh, digit to the uh, the ith zero and one in T. And that's how we get uh, S to be a subsequence of T. Um, because you're basically giving yourself two choices for each character yeah. by putting down n copies of zero. Okay, so here's the code. Uh, first, you input n. 
then you input S. So N is the length of the string, then you input the string. Uh, then you check if they're all the same. So I just have this Boolean here to check that. Uh, if they're not equal, I assign the Boolean to false. Um, so it, if at the end of the loop, they are all the same, I print out, I just print out the string itself because that's an easy solution with a period of one. Otherwise, I print out zero and one n times like we discussed, and that's our answer. Any questions on that? So the solution Alexander had is uh, similar to what we had, um, but basically you're going to have a few less characters because you basically only uh, insert characters if you need them, like if you need to separate two equal things. Mm -hmm. Also, I think you would have to end, like if it ends in a zero, you would have to insert a one at the end, or if it starts with a one, you would have to. I think you don't have to do that. I oh, it's really? It's time to have like a partial period. Oh, it's fine to have a partial period. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true by the definition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that works. This is just, I think this would uh, probably be a little bit simpler to code, though. So, uh, yeah, this just makes it easier. All right. So, I think this is our last problem. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think we have a couple after this. Oh, we have a couple? Okay. Um, so, you're given an infinite grid of squares. And you're given some integer n. And you're trying to find, you're trying to color this grid with a, uh, color this grid with uh, gray, such that no gray cells have an odd number of gray neighbors. And n gray cells have four gray neighbors. And all gray cells are connected. Um, so for instance, in this sample case, uh, this is when n equals four. So the four ones in the center, they each have four gray neighbors. But the ones on the outside, they only have two, which is okay because they don't have an odd number of gray neighbors, which is not allowed. So you're trying, given n, you're trying to output a graph like this. So one thing that might help here is to think that, uh, at like the base case, when n equals one, how would you what would you have to print for n equals one? It also really helps that paper and pen for this again. There's a bunch of answers to this, by the way. So anything you can come up with yeah. is fine. So the issue with that is that the gray cells need to be connected. Uh, that's like the third condition. So with like a checkerboard pattern, they're not they're not connected to each other. Uh, also, um, neighbors is only yeah. We're not including diagonals. Oh yeah, it's, it's neighbors like neighbors problem. Diagonals. Yeah. Um, you have to print out a finite number eventually. Yeah. So. <laughs> Infinitely means there's no edge, right? Like you can't say, "Oh, this is in the corner." Yeah, there's no there's no corners on the graph on the grid, basically. So a plus sign. Um, the issue with that is the you're very close. The uh, though. The gray cells on the ends of the plus signs, like not the center, but the ones around it, those are going to have one gray neighbor, and that's an odd number, so that can't, yeah. But you're very close. Like, think how you would change the plus sign into something that doesn't have Tom, any odd. Thomas got it, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, you do, so I'll just show the next slide. Uh, wait, wait, uh, but before you do that, uh, how do you generalize that for yeah. n bigger than 1? We should have put this in the two slides. Uh, now that I'm thinking about this, uh, so Thomas, you have to be connected is the issue. So you can't just do any of them. Yeah. So 
we maybe try to figure it out for n equals two and then uh we can generalize it could you like tessellate those diagonally like have the corner line up where the gap is yeah i think that's exactly it right so yeah so uh there's two ways to do this two ways that we know of uh so on the left is what Thomas described is you have like this plus sign plus two corner pieces. Um, and you just keep on repeating that n times. Um, and on the right, you have like this snake like thing uh, where you have all these uh, squares um, and you repeat that. N times. Uh, so as you can see, the ones that are like darkened, those are the ones that have four neighbors and the ones that are light, those are the ones that have two and you can't have any other uh, number of neighbors because you can't have odd num a number of neighbors here. Okay. I don't actually have any code for this because it's kind of hard to output. Um, so trouble sort, you're given an array A of N integers and an array B of zeros and ones. And you can swap any elements A, I, and AJ as long as the Bs don't equal each other. So BI, BI does not equal BJ. And the question is whether you can sort the array or not. So if you can sort the array, you print yes. And if you can't, you print no. Um, so for example, with 312 and 000, you can't do any swaps here because all the Bs are equal to each other. And uh, so the answer is going to be no here. In this case, three one, uh, you have 312 and 010. Uh, what you can do here is you can swap. Um, well, let's see if you can come up with how you can swap it on yourself. But uh, you can get A to be sorted in this case by swapping things where the Bs are not, indexes where the Bs are not equal. So the answer is yes here. So again, this might help if you have paper and pen. Uh, just figure out when you can print yes and when you can print no. The entries of B are alternating, then yes. That is actually them. true, but you, you can, can generalize this even more. more. Yeah. Maybe one hint is try to think about like longer series of swaps and when yeah. they let you do the things you want. Also think of the cases, I think it's easier here to think of the cases when you can't do it than the cases when you can. Uh, so like for, uh, like one of the sample cases, like why can't you do it in that case? So as long as two consecutive B elements are not the same, swaps are permitted. They don't necessarily need to be consecutive. Uh, so are not the same. Yeah, when you're doing a swap, um, you don't have to be swapping adjacent elements. Yeah, You can swap any two elements in the array. Yeah, uh, Thomas basically got it. Uh, there's one other case you have to consider, though. So uh, if there is at least a 0 or a 1, so if there's if B is all the same, when can you do it and when can you not do it? Because if B has two different elements, then you can, what Thomas said is you can basically always do it. There's only one element in B, it only works. Slightly more general than that. Yeah. Right, because you only have one element in B in the first sample case, but you can't do it there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's go to the solution slide. So if all of the Bs are the same, then ret return true if A is sorted, false otherwise. So if A is sorted, you've already solved the, you've already got A sorted, so it's going to be true. Uh, but if they're all the same, then you can't do any swaps, and A is not sorted, so it would be false. Uh, otherwise, we can show that it's actually always possible. Uh, and to show that, uh, we can, 
we want to show that we can swap any two arbitrary elements, AI and AJ. Um, because if you can swap any two arbit arbitrary elements, AI and AJ, you can sort the array. Um, so if BI does not equal BJ for I and J, then we can just do the swap because that's a condition in the problem. But if they're equal, what we have to do is find a K such that BK does not equal BI. And that's guaranteed to exist because uh, BI is not all the same. So there has to be an, an element that's not equal to BI. And then you can do the following swaps. So first you swap I and K, then you swap I and J, and then you swap J and K. Uh, so basically like you use K as like a temporary placeholder and you can, uh, you can use it to swap I and J. Um, if you click forward, we have an animation on the okay. right. Yeah. How that works. So we swap I and K. So I is now A of K and K is now I, A of I. Then you swap J, I and J. AJ, AK. And then you sw swap J and K. Wait. Um, I'm just realizing that this doesn't work. Yeah, you can't swap uh, I and yeah, J, right? Yeah, you can't swap right? I and J. What, what the hell? Yeah. I think it's supposed to be you swap IK, you swap yeah. JK, and then you swap IK again, right, or something? Yeah, it's something like that. It's the three swaps, but not those three swaps. <laughs> Isn't it yeah. just I and K and... Oh, wait, wait. It's IK, JK, and IK, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, let okay. me update the slides. Yeah, so that's that's incorrect, but you do IK, JK, I, IK, and that will allow you to swap any two arbitrary elements. Uh, so the code, basically, uh, since we're running low on time, I won't really go through this, but basically you just check if they're all the same. If they are all the same, you print, uh, if they're not all the same, you print yes, no matter what. If they all are the same, you check if it's sorted. And if it is sorted, you print yes, otherwise you print no. All right. So thanks so much for coming guys. Um, we'll post the slides are on the info channel. You can access all slides on that channel. And we'll also post the recording soon on YouTube. Um, we have a practice contest every week following the beginner lectures. So if you haven't already, you can join our code forces group. Um, we'll probably post that. Have we have, do we have that posted on the info? Uh, um, that should be there. Let me okay. post it in chat too. Okay. And yeah, you can just practice these A and B problems if you want over the next week. So make sure you make a code forces account. Um, and next week we will be covering data structures and uh, standard library in C++. So if you're unfamiliar with C++, this is a great way to get more familiar with it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, when are we doing practice contests again? This Are we doing them this week? Uh, that is going to be on the Thursdays where we don't do lectures. So the week after next Thursday is our first one. OK. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.